This is where business ideas and passions turn into profit. Napkin ideas are no longer tucked away in drawers, and women around the globe are turning their hobbies into million-dollar businesses. Welcome to Million Dollar Hobbies. Here's your host, world-renowned jewelry designer and Shop HQ celebrity, Victoria Wick. Welcome to another episode of Million Dollar Hobbies show. This, to th- this morning is a very special morning because uh, you might um, find that my, I sound a little differently. I don't have my normal equipment and I am broadcasting today out of my basement. <laughs> we call it the basement. It's like a wine cellar basement due to construction outside. But um, instead of rescheduling, I decided to just go ahead with it because the guest that I have is absolutely adorable. She is a special, special person. And um, I couldn't wait to have this interview with her. And uh, nothing was gonna stop me from interviewing her today. And in fact, I'm going to release this episode uh, ahead of schedule for a lot of other, because you know, you really feel like the um, topic is completely necessary and so relevant. So who are we talking about? We're talking about a mental health expert. In fact, she has been uh, considered the mental health trailblazer, uh, Dr. Roseanne um, Kapana Hodge. And uh, she's also known as Dr. Roseanne um, and you can Google her. Uh, She has literally been, um, she's interviewed over 300, by, by about 300 different broadcasts. So the demand is very high. But more than anything, um, Dr. Roseanne is absolutely the most authentic, genuine, caring, heartfelt individual that you're, that you're gonna fall in love with. And if you have any kids or have, you, know, you have friends who have any kids, or you work with people who struggle with um, you know, the compassion for their children and childcare, you're at the right place. And uh, so without further ado, let me uh, introduce you to Dr. Roseanne. Welcome to the show. Well, Victoria, thank you for that. That was beautiful. And I'm just going to give you a a big hug for that because that was sweet. I'm definitely a woman on a mission to change the way we view and treat mental health. And that's why we're having this conversation because mental health, whether you're uh, a parent at home or you're an entrepreneur or you're a C-level executive in this time, mental health has to be a priority for everybody because nobody is unaffected by the stress of the pandemic. For sure. But, you know, let me, uh, let's even go back up a little bit. And I know that you probably would agree with me that the mental health was probably just exasperated more by the pandemic. But I mean, I'm a parent of two children. And when I was raising my kids, uh, uh, I will say this, as an immigrant coming to this country, without speaking English or anything like that, and, you know, running a business, as you know, you're an entrepreneur yourself. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurship has its challenges, many challenges. I mean, crisis happen every single day. We're fighting fires all around us all the time. But I will tell you this, when it comes to any business decision, whether it's a $100,000 decision, $5 decision, $5 million decision, I can handle it. But when it comes to the stresses that come from my kids, oh my God. It's, it's the only thing that could really just stop me in my tracks. And so I want to say that, you know, first of all, thank you so much for working in this space. You know, children's mental, mental health is, um, I think it's, it's an absolute necessity. Every school should have it. Every school district should have it. And this is the unknown fact, in my humble opinion, and you can disagree. At, at, in my show, people can disagree all the time. I, don't, <laughs> I really don't have answers, and plenty of people have. I will say that, wouldn't you agree that our inability as a society to deal with mental health of children, it's costing corporations tons of money, billions of dollars, don't tons you think? Tons of money. I mean, you know, when we talk about Prior to the pandemic, right, 1 million workers miss uh, work a day Mm -hmm. due to stress um, in general. And then now look at what's happening now, right? So the American Psychological Association does a survey every year called Stress in America. So this 2021 uh, 20 uh, survey said that 70% of parents have moderate to severe levels of stress due to the pandemic, okay? 70% of parents, 
who are we employing? Most companies right. are employing yeah. people with kids. And so we're having difficulties getting our employees back into uh, work, right? We're losing yeah. highly skilled, trained workers, especially women, okay? Right. And uh, this is serious stuff. 40,000 kids in America lost a parent due to COVID. Wow. So we're now having single parents going back to work. They lost their partners and, you know, all of the challenges of working from home are, are still going to impact us to some degree. This pandemic is not over. And then Victoria, you're hundred percent right. We walked into this pandemic and I'm not going to use potty words. It was terrible. The mental health <laughs> yes. of our kids. Yeah. yeah. Okay. For sure. In, For sure. In January of 2020, I created the global Institute of children's mental health because I'm so concerned, right? So here I am, you know, I have this Ridgefield, Connecticut center. We see people virtually and in person and how many people could I help? Not, not that many. Not and enough. so I needed yeah. to have a global input, you know, in, you know, impact. And every single company, every single organization, every single school needs to be proactive right now. We are ill equipped at what is going to happen when, as we're reentering the workforce, as you already said, people are going back to work. And then when kids go back to school well, in let me, August let's... and September. Yeah, let's go back. Let's back up a little bit, because I think that um, COVID um, pandemic was kind of like a good excuse for a lot of corporations, a lot of people, a lot of companies to kind of overlook the problems they had going in um, in schools, failing schools. They, they did the same thing. It was just like the sort of like, like, you know, like the one convenient excuse for everything. So let's uh, step back a little bit. Like, um, I want to also talk a little bit about like the what impact social media has on sure. our kids as well as on you know in our schools um i was really lucky because my children sort of just missed the the impact i mean they still had my space and i thought that was dangerous i really thought like oh my god what am i gonna do with my space i mean you know all that i mean god those are the good old days <laughs> you know now with um you know instagram and every, you know, it's just correct me if i'm wrong but i just feel like society as a whole even grown-ups like we're oh. literally posting things like i'm drinking the six dollar coffee or you know whatever like it's so shallow when, yeah let's unpack that victoria yeah, please right <laughs> yeah, so let me know. please like i'm helpless so, over here let's start with the adults let's start with the top yeah. here right so first of all there's a toxic component about social media right first yeah. of all it's it's really you know they call facebook fake book right people are presenting yeah fake images, unrealistic right. images, and there's a lot of pressure. People are also feel very comfortable hate posting oh. and putting negative speak. I don't even understand why people would go out of their way to be rude. Yeah. It's so much easier to go out of way to be nice. Okay. Oh, absolutely. And when you're nice to people, people, it has such a positive trickle effect. Like from the brain perspective, when you smile at people, yeah, it, it all these um, neurotransmitters or release feel good stuff on you with them. They start smiling, they smile at right. <laughs> somebody else. It's the same thing when we write positive things, right? You know, right. I put heart emojis on every comment I make on my post just to put love out in the world, right? Like right. we can't, and we're role modeling for our kids. Right. So what are kids, what's happening with all of this overuse of technology? Well, first of all, Let's start with, and I'm more concerned about what kids are missing out on That's by being yeah. on, on their devices. So, so they're true. missing out on socialization, right? <laughs> right. Exercise, hands-on skills, and also how to self-regulate their brain and body without technology. So what do they do when they're stressed, right? What are their problem solving skills like, right? And so we're creating this culture. We joke about you know, everybody was joking about, um, you know, overeating and binge watching Netflix during the right, pandemic, right. because yeah. that was their unhealthy cope me mechanism. Not to say that you, you can't have a weekend where you watch yeah. Netflix, but if you're doing it every day, you, you're not doing what you're supposed to do to take care of yourself. 
But when it comes to technology, here's what the research says. So not all technology is bad, not all social media is bad. The more interactive it is, so if we're having conversations with our friends, right? So kids use an app called Discord, right? And they use it while they're gaming and they have fun. It's actually been found to improve mental health. Now, That's if good. we're passive scrolling, like mm -hmm. YouTube, so, you know, social yeah. media, it's actually associated with anxiety and depression, right? But the reality is before the pandemic, the average teenager in 2019 was spending seven hours and 22 minutes on technology wow. every day. Yeah, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Seven hours and a uh, eight to 12 year old was spending four and three quarters hours. So can I ask you, let me ask you, I know you've done, yeah. uh, you, you've written a book. And I yeah. know you've done all this research. Uh, I've written a book myself. And when, when I, I, you know, when you write a book, you really do have to make sure that every word has been vetted and counted and researched yes. because, you know, any, or hopefully millions of people are going to buy your book because it's obviously needed. Do you think that a lot of parents use the social, the fact that the kids are using their devices as almost like a babysitters because they're kind of uh, entertaining yeah. themselves I mean, or yeah, where do I mean, parents fit in in this whole thing? Yeah, you know, and- in my book, it's going to be okay. I'm a research nerd. So there's over 40 pages of research citations. Now, what is that so, book called again? It's called, it's going to be okay. Book. It's going to be okay. All right. Well, you right? said it and, and I thought it was okay. Sounds it's good. It's what I tell okay. every parent By that Dr. I work Rosa. with. Yeah. Okay. Right. So every parent I work with is worried about their kid and you said it, right? You are only as happy as your happiest kid. If your right. kid is struggling socially, emotionally, academically with their siblings, whatever is going on and they're stuck, you feel a stress and anxiety that is indescribable. You can slay yeah. business, right. you can do yeah, whatever obstacle, but when it comes to your kids, mental and physical health, if they're struggling in any way, shape or form, it's really, really hard. And so, you know, when, you know, it comes to kids, and, you know, understanding what's, what's happening to them and, and, and the struggles that they have, you know, not all technology is bad. It's here to stay. Right. It's evolving. But you can't let your kids be on there for seven hours because it's convenient for babysitting. You can't. Well, you can't right? have them seven hours uh, without supervision. I mean, they're, if they're doing it to Google search their um, academic right. problems. Or even just problem solving themselves in a healthy you know, environment that's different, obvious. I mean, I, I agree with you that technology is neutral. It's, uh, it right. doesn't have the power to corrupt you completely. No. Um, only who uses it, how do they use it? You know what I mean? So, And I, are they not doing physical activity? Are they not actually right. socializing, right? You know, we can't be in a world. We just saw what it was like to be isolated. Like, it wasn't right. fun. Yeah. Right. And, oh, I know. Ah. Uh, and it was brutal on people and even just employees, right? I mean, I saw changes in a lot of companies with how do they keep their company culture when people weren't together? And company culture is really important course, for yes. mm -hmm. a business, right? Yeah. Um, whether you have a small business or a big business, we all need to think about the culture of our company. I think it's so, so important and often missed, right? Um, and, and that's why we're having this conversation because as more people come back, you know, I've reached out to many companies in the very beginning, in the first month of the pandemic, I was connecting with companies and they were like, it's too early to bring right. in employee stress management. Well, now what's happening is they all, they all want to talk to me a year plus later because people are struggling and these are that your every employee is an asset. Of course. And yeah. It's, it's your biggest asset. It's your Normally, biggest course, asset, yeah. right? Besides your reputation. And they are sure. an extension mm -hmm. of your reputation. Sure. Yeah. And so if we're just like, we're going to get somebody else, well, let me tell you son, Mr. Employer or Mrs. Employer, every person in America is completely stressed out for the most part. And so you're going to go from one stressed employee to another. And instead you're going to have to invest, reinvest training time for them, which depending on what industry you are at, you know, could be, I'm in, uh, uh, have a team of psychotherapists. It takes me a good 18 months 
to really get somebody up to speed to the Dr. Roseanne methodologies because we're doing things so different. And so whenever I lose somebody, I'm like, wow, that was 18 months just lost. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Right. I have a, I have a question. So sure. uh, let me um, ask you because um, a lot of entrepreneurs, I, I understand in the corporate world, because I used to be in corporate and I deal with a lot of large corporations uh, who are my customers and I see it. Um, they're more likely to tell me because I'm not a co-employee. You know, sometimes they'll say, hey, you know, I've got problems with my kid, you know, whatever. Um, I remember one of my buyers had a kid. Um, so she, she had a kid and then she was pregnant with the second kid. And she had just uh, received word because, you know, something was wrong with their older child. Um, you know, he was sneezing. There was a bunch of things that was happening. And we were actually flying to Hong Kong for a trade show. By the time we got there, they had done a, run a complete check on this, um, her, her son and this, uh, her, uh, she, the son was cared by, cared for by her husband and um, her mother while she was traveling for three days in Hong Kong. But during this whole time, they diagnosed him with uh, autism. Okay. Um, so, you know, this was, uh, you know, a tough news for her at that time. And I think that as entrepreneurs um, and employers, when an employee is hurting, um, you know, whether they've, they got financial problems, marital problems, children's problems, we want to be very compassionate. We want to be there because in my own company, uh, it is like family. Um, you know, I'm not a huge company. So the thing that I could offer my employees is that family environment where we actually care about every employee and their, you know, members. So we want to be very compassionate and be there for them, be present for them. And, you know, when somebody's sick, you don't want them to worry about the work and the sickness, we want them to kind of get ready for, you know, get well first. At the same time, though, it isn't fair for the other employees to have to pick up the, you know, slack, um, because a lot of companies are running pretty tight. And your customers um, who come to you, they deserve the service that they pay for. So what happens is when you have more than one employee out, um, you know, on any given day, uh, in a department, uh, you know, a large company, you, you could have 10, 20 people out. Um, it does create stress uh, to your system. And uh, so how do we uh, entrepreneurs who are aware of uh, the, the, the necessity to be compassionate and to su be supportive, how do we then balance all of this? And, you know, do you have any um, coping mechanisms or a way that we can actually implement a system that would be fair to everybody. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, there's just like a family, right? And I, yeah. I think of my company as a family too. And, and we treat people just like, you know, even better than your family member. Yeah, you chose these people, the right? Question. You know, always tell me that. <laughs> right. Um, but it all, you want to front load it, right? So people will go through different you know, struggles at different times. Right. And you're hundred percent right. You're smaller. You there's strains to the system, whether you're large or you're big. Right? right. And, and when people struggle in different ways, depending on how they're communicating with others, if they bring sort of a toxicity component, they really start, you know, falling, faltering and falling down at work. This can spread like a cancer at work. Right. If, right. and that's really important. So I'm all about front loading and it's all about regular communication. It's about meetings that really talk about things, but I use a protocol called the reps protocol and I teach reps to kids. I teach it to individuals and I teach it to corporations. And it really is a four-step process to cut stress and cutting stress and emphasizing yeah. stress management on the individual level and on the corporate level is now going to be a necessity going forward. If you were not doing this before, yeah. you, you better get a motor on it because we need to help people regulate their nervous system. And, and just to be a science geek for one second, our autonomic nervous system controls our stress levels. If you are stressed out, you're in a sympathetic dominant state. If you are relaxed, you're in a parasympathetic state. I call it the hot tub state. And we want our people to be in a hot tub state for themselves, for right. the corporation, for the people that they're interacting with. So in my reps pro protocol, four steps, respirate, which is breathe, envision, which is seeing success 
and setting that tone. And every entrepreneur already does that. P is positivity using positive language with visualization and S is stress management. And so I teach people how to breathe first. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, when we have control and we're in this relaxed parasympathetic state, guess what happens? We can think and act more clearly. Right. Right. And so when we emphasize this, whether this is something you're like, Hey, it's reps time at work, or you're teaching people. And then that, that, um, E the envision and the positivity I put together and it's saying positive things and you create a culture at work where you have positive speak and you're, Hey, I know this is hard for you. What do you see ahead of you? Like today? Right. What do you see reducing stress today? This is how you start talking to people. We hack into the brain to get people feeling better and we want to support our employees. And then the S is regular stress management. So whether you're doing breathing breaks at work or your yoga, or you're having everybody walk, right? Whatever it is, we need 10 minutes a day to help keep that nervous system regulated. So people are less reactive, less irritable. They're sleeping better. They're thinking more clearly their attention. They're, they're really a better employee and human being. So that's what I teach people because it's simple and everybody can do it. And there's no barriers of time or finances or experience. And, and truly anybody of any age can do the reps protocol. You know, it's uh, really interesting. Uh, when I hear you talk about the reps protocol, it seems like it's a system that's going to really work, but I, I think more than anything, um, when you talk about how things are communicated, um, I live by this one quote. I mean, I, I'm a avid reader. I love reading books and I'm going to get your book too, because it's, even though I don't, my kids are older now, uh, I feel like mental health is something that you've got to constantly improve uh, because situations arise all the time. Yes. Uh, but I, th- I live by this one uh, quote, and that is uh, by Maya Angelou, and it, um, she's written you know, tons of quotes, but the one that I love the most is, uh, people will forget what you said, what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Yes, so right. I think that um, a lot of the, imp- what I've noticed when I was in working in corporate, and, all, and I've kind of implemented that in my own company, after I, I formed my own company, I learned a lot of the things what not to do, um, because in a smaller company, you've got a much better control over, you know, who you hire. Um, a lot of times bigger companies, HR hires somebody and, you know, you end up with someone that is, may not be a perfect match for you. I think, you know, a lot of it, if the employee is having issues with their children, whether it's at school or the children are not doing, you know, they're sick or they're, there's a lot of things that, could, that, you know, it doesn't take a lot for a parent to be stressed out over their kid, as you know. Absolutely. Um, then when you, if your first thought is, oh my God, I'm going to get fired or, oh my God, what would happen if I, you know, if my customer complains or, oh my God, you know, so if your first thought is going to that, then it adds to the stress exponentially and you're less likely to talk about it, get some help. Whereas if you create an environment, a culture where if you have a problem, if you have one person who has a problem, it's everybody's problem. Um, so if you feel like you're supported, if you feel like, oh my God, you know, I need to get to my child's school and I know I've got two coworkers that's going to cover for me. And when they need some help, whether it's with their mother or, you know, maybe they need help with their grandkids or whoever, I'm going to be there for them. So I think that if it's communicated in a certain way that, you know, it's little things, it's not like, it doesn't have to cost a fortune. It doesn't have to, you know, cost a whole program but it's just being conscientious about how you're heard and how you're supported, I think um, are, are simple ways. I mean, low hanging fruit to um, uh, you know, a better culture. And don't wait for your ki- your employees to break down. Like, you know, right, I recently exactly. saw one of my employees, she didn't look like her perky self. And I said, you know, I'll make up a name, you know, hey, Amy what's going on? Is there anything I can do to help you with? And she was like, you know what? I just have not been myself. And she's like, I need to, you know, get out more. And, and I was like, make sure you go for a walk at lunch or, you know, and she just, all of a sudden that one comment just turned things around. I didn't criticize her. 
you know, I, we just are a team and we know each other. So, you know, encourage your, if you're a large company, encourage your employees to lift each other, right. right to absolutely. focus yeah. on some wellness or give them and, rewards, reward points for, you know, yes. for being that, uh, you know, like a miscongeniality or whoever, like, you know, have little recognition for going above and beyond. And I think, um, I think the other thing too, is like, um, and we talked about this just briefly before the show, you know, we went through probably uh, two or three decades of people um, and it was not just a corporate culture, but cu- culture as a society, as a country, uh, maybe it's a global, you know, cause I travel quite a bit that we went through like decades of people comparing each other and competing with one another. And you know what? None of us are gonna get that far uh, by doing that. Uh, if you if that's your go-to mechanism for succeeding, I got I got news for you. All those people who did that to me, they're you know still trying to pay rent, and I'm here sitting nicely <laughs> on my little you know. Well, they ground. have a scarcity mindset, right? I mean, what did you say to me, yeah. Victoria? Rising tide lifts all boats, all boats right? Definitely. Mm-hmm. And so, and isn't the journey so much nicer when you're oh, with people absolutely. that lift you? I mean, it's Absolutely. just amazing. Yeah, not only that, I think, you know, um, my dad, he's passed, you know, some time ago, but he used to say that um, being able to help people is it's such a privilege and a joy, um, but also being able to get help, being, you know, inspired, you know, be, being an inspiration for somebody is great, but being inspired is a whole other thing as well. So it is a give and take. And I think that and, you know, what, what I loved about what you do, because uh, you're, I think you're the only mental health professional I've had on, because I feel like so many other people do it so much better than I do. And it's something I really don't understand well, but I do know there's a huge need for it. And especially at the children's level, because I feel like children right now are the most vulnerable and they were vulnerable long before COVID when, you know, when there long were before comes, COVID. yeah, when people are working and they're focused on their careers, you know, women are now going and getting their, you know, doctorates and PhDs and, you know, multiple doctorates. They're not even inter- making any money till like they're like 30. Right. So they feel like they missed out on things. They missed out on travel. They missed out on, you know, making money, they, all that. So, you know, there is a thought that, um, and I'm not saying, I'm not judging anybody over this, but there is a thought that, you know, Um, the best way I can take care of my kids is by being really successful at my work so that I could be an inspiration. I could be somebody they could look up to and I can make a lot more money so I can impact them. In the meantime, mentally, they feel like they're abandoned or they feel like they don't matter or they feel like the best thing they could do to help their parents would be kind of be out of sight. So uh, this vicious cycle keeps on going on or at least that's what I witnessed in when I was raising my kids, I saw that quite a bit, you know, and I, you know, my kids got raised in a very affluent area. And, um, and I saw the, unfortunately, the result of this now, you know, my children are now in their late twenties and I'm seeing that um, the impact of what those parents didn't do, they're just now coming. Well, to reality. you know, I think there's such a false message to families and women in particular that we, it's okay to spread ourselves thin. It's okay to not have any self-care. And, and I think during this pandemic, you know, what people brought to the table, right. Is what helped them get through it. We say this when we do trauma work. And um, I was one of the approved providers for Sandy Hook. I got to see, you know, who did, who did well. Who did well in that awful tra- tragedy? And right. um, and really, in, in even my 20 years of trauma work before that, was that if people had good resiliency, they knew how to cope, right? Their mindset, they just didn't view stress in the same way. You're able to get through everyday stressors or huge stressors right. completely differently than somebody who has no stress tolerance. And so when it comes to families and particularly, you know, we're, we're working moms, right? Right, right. When you spread yourself thin, I have a girlfriend who literally was sleeping two to three hours a day. And she said, well, I've been doing it through my twenties. And I said, you have three kids under age six. And she's like, what did you do when your kids were little? And I go, I worked two and a half days a week. Yeah. She was like, yeah. what? And I'm like, I'm not farming my kids out. I wanted to be with them 
And that's, we reprioritized our lives. And right. Dr. Roseanne said no to work, said no to things. Right. You know, the opportunities, right. I never worried the opportunities. You know, I made enough money. So, you know, this is different when you're in poverty and you don't have a choice, right? So, um, but we just have to now understand that you've got to put your own max oxygen mask on. Just like a computer that needs yeah. to reboot you got to turn off people. And before you blink, your kids will grow up and you want to be there as their anchor. You want to be there to teach them about how to care for themselves and how to have coping skills, because that is what's going to create a successful and happy adult. And, you know, when you ask a parent what they want for their kids, they don't say, I want them to go to an Ivy league. They say, I want them to be healthy and happy. So let's do that. And it starts with you by role modeling and, and parents have so much power over how their kids develop. I don't want you to be overwhelmed by that. I want you to be excited by that. And, you know, yeah, let me ask you a question though. Um, Now your book is already finished, right? um, Yes. It's it's going to be okay. 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 Yep. It's out. You can go to, it's going to be okay.com or you can go to Amazon and, and Google. It's going to be okay on Amazon, or I should say, search it and it will pop up. Okay, so um, we're, we're coming to a close, uh, yeah. but I just want all of you uh, to go ahead and get the book because honestly, if you're a mom, you're a grandma, you are, um, you know, I'm about to be a grandma, her philosophy, Dr. Rosanne's philosophy doesn't apply only to kids. It applies to grown up adults who never actually grew out of the childhood stage, I guess, yeah. mentally. <laughs> I work with a lot of them. Um, it's really amazing. And I believe that mental health is something that all of us can improve on because that's, you know, little things that we could do. But let me ask you a question. So I understand that, um, you know, as parents, we have a lot of control um, because everything starts at home. So what are the things that we could do now with our kids? Like, for example, uh, at my home, um, we always have dinner together. Uh, We're not allowed to have, um, you know, separate dinners. Um, so we always have dinner together. It could be sometimes we don't have dinner till 730 or eight o'clock, but because people have, you know, if one person has to zoom internationally or whatever, we wait until everybody's ready. And we uh, go around the room and talk about your highlights for the day and then your lowlights for the day. And everybody has to come up with one and we go in, you know, and we talk about that because at least this gets you to think about. So it's just one thing that we do in my family. Um, but like, what are the things that, that parents can implement on a daily basis that tells the children, like, you know, like let them know when they're stressed out and how, what are the coping mechanisms and, you know, what's the go-to. Um, yeah. So I love this question. So mm-hmm. first of all, in my book, it's going to be okay. I dive into exactly how to improve mental health and give you the step-by-step tools that are actionable and easy. And the number one thing I say all the time in this book is exactly what you're doing, Victoria. Little waves create big waves. So we often think there is like a magic pill and I have a magic wand that I literally put on my desk and pull it out and every appointment just to let them know. And so it, it really starts with what are you, what are you doing at home? And for you, that's a communication point, right? right. So this is how we're going to connect. And so what I say to parents, the number one thing that they can do in, in small ways yeah. is to flip how they're talking to kids. We have to empower kids right. to cope. Kids today have zero stress tolerance. You cannot walk around in the world, regardless of your level of affluence. Trust me, I see every income point in the world. I have had kids of billionaires and you have to have an internal resilience and grit. And it comes, we need to get kids comfortable with being uncomfortable and it comes from making mistakes. And every entrepreneur like, oh, my best learning has come from my mistakes. Oh, for sure. Right. And (laughs) so- safe little ways to make mistakes. So for example, your kid gets an F on a test or or gets a C and is totally upset. Instead of saying, well, I'm going to call that teacher and we're going to make sure that you, no, what are they going to learn from that? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. You're going to say, huh, you got to see. So 
you didn't get, you got an A last time. What did you do differently? Yeah. Okay. You got to get them thinking. They might be like, well, you know, last time I really studied. Okay. So what are you going to do next time? How is that going to look different? That is completely different. When you do the first thing, you tell your kid they have no power and no control. And this is probably the most important thing a parent can do. I cannot on like literally highlight this more. And those simple shifts, it creates confidence in kids. It creates this comfortableness with being uncomfortable. And it's with that, when you have confidence, your kid has unlimited possibilities. Right. You lack confidence and you think, oh, my kid's going to inherit a, a hundred million dollars. They will not have the same outcome in life that you think they will. It all starts with that resilience and grit. And you have that power by shifting your language. Yeah. So that's really interesting too, because as if you have multiple kids in your family, um, you like, I grew up in a family of five. I'm the oldest of the five. Some of us are like brain surgeons, literally like neuro uh, neurosurgeons <laughs> um, and others, I like, just couldn't cut it in school. You know, my poor mom, uh, my youngest sister just tried going to college four different times. Uh, she flunked every class. In fact, it got so bad that my dad, when he was alive, um, I think she came back with like a, a, a D minus or something. And, you know, instead of like being really upset, like a typical Asian parent would, my dad says, you know, set her down and said, okay, you know, and she thought it was going to be like, oh my God, like, I'm just going to be like disowned or something, you know, just like the second time she got a D minus in the same subject, but it was algebra. He just said, you know, uh, don't try so hard. He said, you tried way too hard for this. And she says, well, how do you, you know, she thought he was just joking. And he said, literally, if you just marked B on every single thing, you would have gotten a 50%. But instead, you try so hard, you got like, you know, a 30%. <laughs> so you obviously try hard. And, um, you know, he had a very different perspective of looking at things. It just, math just wasn't her thing. You know, it just wasn't her yeah. thing. So basically, his whole solution to this was that, you know, like the national average for SAT was X amount, and you are like 20% below that. So let's work on your strengths, which was her language. Um, and he said to your favor, I mean, languages are two thirds of your SAT score. So if we can just get the, uh, that math thing to the national average, which is not that difficult for most people, but to her, this was a monumental thing, right? Then would be okay. You know, so what are the steps? What can we do now to get you to the national average, which is like 50 percentile. And, um, he got her some tutors and all that stuff. She still didn't cut it, but <laughs> she's saying, okay. You know, but I think that the, um, do you believe that a lot of uh, parents, we work so hard, we feel like we're making all the sacrifices for our children and that they owe it to the parents just to like, how hard could it be just to get a stupid A in, in a math class? I mean, do you think that that goes on? And if so, is, is it wrong? I mean, you know, we are using grades as a benchmark of mental health. Mm -hmm. We are saying that if my kid is a straight A student, there's no way they can have anxiety, depression, or suicidal thoughts. And, you know, are some kids A students? Of course, right? Your sister could have tried and tried and tried and tried. And, and me too. I would have never gotten an A in algebra. Yeah. We did okay. I graduated a year early in my doctoral program. Yeah. So you have to just, you can't, push and push and push. And what he did is, and my champ technique and, uh, or in my, about raising successful kids, I talk about honing in on your strengths, right? right. So yeah. we have to hone in our strengths. I'm not saying grades are unimportant. Again, it's, it's, what are we putting ahead of these grades, right? Like we need to put how our kids feel about ourselves, how our kids, you know, your sister wasn't trying, wasn't not trying. Yeah, she of tried hard. She, she tried hard. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, your, your father put his common sense and was yeah. like, wait a second, let's be strategic. In that moment, he taught her a lesson that was like, wait, I'm really good at this. So why don't I work a little harder on this to show right. how I have the strength on this, right? right? Right. Um, instead of punishing her and blaming her and shaming her. 
grades can't be everything. And we're missing out on really some of these amazing gifts our kids have. Like um, my kids are super kind and yeah. teachers write comments on one of my kids um, report cards. Like it's hard to describe h- how amazing it is to have your kid in my class. Yeah, It's yeah. not because of his grades. He's a good student. He's very right, conscientious. Right. He is so kind. Like his teacher wrote, he is the friend to everybody. Yeah. Like I could die and go to heaven right now. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done my job. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, so let's rethink what are the values of our kids? Because we know that emotional intelligence is one of the biggest determinants of success, success. Yeah, for financial sure. and academic success. So yeah. let's yeah. emphasize that. I love that. And I know that um, you have been on every show. I'm talking like Fox News, CBS, NBC, uh, Forbes, you may say today, Yahoo News, you've been on everything. Washington Post, New York Times. Um, I am just so glad that you've made time today for you know my audience, and uh, I'm sure that you know uh, those of you who are listening, go ahead and listen to it again because I think that all I wouldn't say all of our society's will uh, ills, but a very significant portion of uh, what we are experiencing today in terms of you know the cultural, racial, social income divide has to do with. Uh, what the past generations, you know, specifically my generation of people have not done before. Uh, we didn't know any better, but we still right now have a chance to impact um, things. And I'm glad that, you know, um, people like Dr. Wazan is out there trying to shift the dynamic, uh, not just for, you know, the parents here, but really for, for the world. I mean, I think that this is also, by the way, global. You know, I travel millions of miles uh, with my business. And um, a lot of the people I deal with are, you know, female professionals, and that's our number one worry. I mean, I remember sitting um, in Dubai, you know, with women that are completely covered up and we're discussing our kids and our worries. And, you know, the, it's exactly the same, exactly. Uh, the you know, same. Moms, yeah, we have a, uh, where women are DNA coded to really be nurturing to, we have the maternal instinct that doesn't, that, that transcends our you know, age, religion, um, you know, geographical culture. So I'm just so glad that you gave us a healthy dose of um, your experience and your advice and uh, good luck to you with um, your, you know, books. And I'm going to go get it and I'm going to invite you back uh, for Christmas time because I know that as hard as we try, we're going to be all stressed out by uh, November, December for sure. Uh, Thank you so much for coming by. Thank you for this conversation. And, you know, for anybody who's struggling right now, all it takes is starting with one thing, whether mm-hmm. it's breathing, just do it and, and just move and create change for yourself. Don't let the overwhelm eclipse you. You know, you no, just have ask, to start small. I forgot. Um, now you do have, um, so other than uh, people Googling you, yeah. Um, do you want people to come to you? I mean, do you have free seminar, uh, webinars or anything like that where people can just participate yeah, we with other have, parents even? Yeah. Um, you can you can go to drrosanne.com and you can see what we have going on. But we, um, I have a community and you can go to the Get Unstuck program okay. and it's you get our program and our community you can join our community to get support on how to create successful kids in at home, in school, in life, and how to really implement these ways to nurture your kid and hone in on their strengths. Um, Because every kid is different and every strength is different. And you're, you know, I've got 30 years of experience and I'm sharing them with this with you so that you can take these little hacks and really help to blossom your family. Cause you know, like you said, it doesn't matter who you are. If you're a parent, that's where your heart is. Yeah. Um, and nothing's more important than the mental and physical health of our kids. And when we concentrate on that, that's when the magic happens. That's when our kids really have success in friendships or academics, or maybe they're an Eagle scout, you know, like there's just so many different ways. And I think when we start to open that, you know, we really change the impact of stress on yeah. this generation and the next. Yeah. Thank so. you so much for coming by. And until next time, stay healthy, stay happy. And remember, happiness is a choice.
You've been listening to Million Dollar Hobbies, where we turn dreams into reality and passion into profit. According to ancient Chinese proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Congratulations on taking that first step today. For more information on how Victoria can help you turn your hobby into a million dollars and to download Victoria's free ebook on passion-based business ideas, visit milliondollarhobbies.com. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show on your favorite podcast player.